In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, we read, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. In this verse, there's a number of details that we might wonder about but simply aren't told. For example, where was Jesus? The text says he was in a certain place, but the location isn't specified. The request by the disciple followed the Lord's prayer, but we don't know how did he know Jesus was praying. Did he see his posture and knew the Lord was praying? Did he hear him praying out loud? We're not told. The term when he finished might cause us to wonder about the length of the prayer. But we don't know how long or short it was. We don't know any of its contents. We also have a reference to John teaching his disciples to pray. But we don't find any example of this in the scriptures about this instruction by John. We also have the disciple who made the request remaining unnamed. It was just one of the disciples. But what we do know is the fact that Jesus honored this request. In verses 2 through 4, we have what is referred to as the model prayer that Jeff just read for us. This was given to all the disciples as shown by the plural pronoun them in verse 2. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. So often examples can be valuable resources to help us understand what we need to know about specific topics. And through this model prayer, Jesus gives an example of how our prayers to the Father should be. However, this isn't a formula to follow precisely in every situation. We know that from Jesus' own prayer recorded for us in John 17 that differs from the model he gave here. We also have other prayers in the Bible that do not mirror the model prayer exactly as Jesus gave it. It's simply an example to teach us how to pray. Well, we want to turn to the book of Matthew, and in this gospel account, we want to look at another prayer and this, too, is an example of a prayer that can teach us a great deal about how to pray. In Matthew 14, we find a very unusual prayer, and yet it's one that can teach us valuable lessons about how to have effective prayers and what are the characteristics of effective prayers. In Matthew 14, in verses 13 through 21, we have Matthew's account of one of the notable miracles in the life of the Lord. We have Jesus feeding the 5,000. And then beginning in verse 22, we read that immediately after that miraculous event, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. In this case, the apostles, the disciples, are not there when Jesus prays. He's by himself. He had already sent them to the other side of the sea in the boat. And as we join the apostles in the boats, we find that a storm arose. Verse 24 says, But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And so they're in this storm. And in the middle of this, the next verse says, And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now the fourth watch would be somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., at this time in history, night was divided into four watches. According to Mark 13, 35, these were referred to as the evening, midnight, the rooster crowing, and the morning. And so when they're in this fourth watch in the early morning, and in our text, the word he in verse 25 is obviously 
a reference to Jesus. Jesus came to the boat walking on the water that was being tossed by the wind. Here was another miracle performed by Jesus. Because this was impossible, we read when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and John record the fact that Jesus walked on the water. But Matthew's account in Matthew 14 records something that the other two do not. And that is the fact that Simon Peter also walked on the water. When Jesus identified himself, the disciples' hearts were calmed. And notice verses 28 and 29. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. This is Peter walking on the surface of the sea. He's walking on the water, at least for a little while. In verse 30, the text says, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! And here's where we find the prayer of Peter. When fear arose and he started to sink in the water, he cried out to the Lord. This is Peter's prayer in peril. This is a very unusual prayer for several reasons. First of all, because of the circumstances that we've just seen. Peter has been walking on the water, but now he's sinking. This is a -a one-of-a-kind situation with Peter doing what normally would be absolutely impossible. Secondly, this is an unusual prayer because of the brevity. This is an extremely short prayer, only Three words. But in the third place, we want to look at some additional reasons why this prayer is noteworthy. As we examine this prayer, it can serve as an example for us today. As we examine this, we learn some of the characteristics about prayer that need to be true in our own prayers to the Father. This prayer can also remind us about important facts about salvation, not of our physical lives like Peter's concern here, but about our spiritual salvation. But let me make it crystal clear that I'm in no way implying what many religious groups teach. I'm not implying that we just say a prayer and the Lord will save us. The Bible doesn't teach that. Our initial obedience to the gospel does include baptism, that according to Acts 22, verse 16, is what washes away our sins. However, there's some important parallels that we can make about the desire to secure the salvation of our souls if we're a non-Christian. In addition, we can also draw parallels to the prayer of Christians who are asking for forgiveness that comes after genuine repentance of sin. We find in Acts 8, verse 22, there is a way a child of God receives forgiveness. It's not through rebaptism, but rather we learn Simon was told, Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Christians who sin must repent and pray. And so we want to look at Peter's prayer from Matthew 14, verse 20, from four different viewpoints. One is what actually took place in the text, but another is what we can learn about prayer in general terms. Then what we can learn about non-Christians' initial salvation, and finally what Christians can learn about prayer in regard to our prayers for forgiveness. So this is unusual because we're going to have three different applications of these points.
Notice with me, first of all, that Peter's prayer was urgent. This prayer is obviously a prayer of petition. It's calling on the Lord for salvation. And it was a prayer that was extremely urgent. Peter's prayer was prompted by the immediate danger. It was a prayer of urgency. He knew the peril of this situation, and that's what drove him to utter these words. He didn't believe he had no time for prayer. Indeed, he had time for nothing else. This wasn't a case like we find in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, which tells us Peter and John were going up at the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. With Peter here, this wasn't the hour of prayer. But indeed, it was a very pressing moment of prayer. As Charles Spurgeon once noted, it's, it is not a matter of time so much as a matter of heart. If you have the heart to pray, you will find the time. In Peter's mind, in this desperate moment, he had to pray. And he had to pray right then. Notice that Peter's prayer also was a request for immediate response. His petition was for salvation. The word save here in the context properly means to deliver out of danger and into safety. It carries the idea of being rescued. When Peter knew, what Peter knew he needed was the very thing for which he prayed. He needed salvation. Thayer defines the word in this verse as meaning to preserve one who is in danger of destruction. That's why Peter uttered this prayer. The danger demanded that this prayer be characterized by urgency. Peter felt the overwhelming need to pray. No one had to urge him to pray. The other disciples in the boat weren't exhorting him, you know, Peter, you ought to be praying. <laughs> he didn't need that. No one had to convince Peter to call out the Lord after he began sinking. He recognized his need to be rescued. When we consider this, I wonder if we feel a sense of urgency with regard to our prayers. Do we feel an overwhelming need to approach God? Or do we view prayer as something we know we should do when we can fit it into our busy schedule? Perhaps today we don't pray as we should because we don't recognize the need for prayer. We don't recognize the urgency that prayer demands. Think also about the importance of this with spiritual salvation. When we're lost in sin, there should be an overwhelming sense of urgency for salvation. This should be our highest priority, should be filling our minds. Nothing else matters until we secure salvation. When Ananias was with Saul, he asked him in Acts 22, verse 16, And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Saul, there's an urgency here. Why are you waiting? You need salvation. When we recognize our undone condition before God, there ought to be an urgency that fills our hearts. Some people have suggested that if, if a person asking to be baptized can be dissuaded to put it off, perhaps they're not truly converted. What about Christians? When a child of God sins, there should also be an urgency to turn away from that sin and with repentance ask God for his forgiveness. If we view this as a and I'll get around to it sometime type of attitude, then we need to learn about the dangers of sin and its awful consequences. We need to take care of our sins as soon as possible. We simply cannot afford to wait. In the second place, Peter's prayer was also heartfelt. We can have no doubt that Peter's prayer was genuine at this time. The prayer was uttered in the middle of danger from the very depths of despair in his heart. This wasn't a prayer in a church building or at home 
Peter's sinking in the middle of the sea, and the situation is dire. And so this wasn't a standard prayer, if you will. It wasn't a prayer that followed the Lord's model. It was undoubtedly heartfelt and absolutely sincere. There's no pretext. He's not trying to show off for the other disciples in the boat. He simply expresses exactly what's on his mind. He's completely free of pride and arrogance. We also find evidence that this was heartfelt when we realize Peter didn't use some special holy tone in his voice. He didn't even use his inside voice, as we might say today. The text says in verse 30 that Peter cried out. The word from which this is translated literally means to croak. It was used to refer to a raven's piercing cry. And it's defined as to call out aloud, to speak with a loud voice. We can just imagine Peter's voice as he was crying out to Jesus. There's no pretense. He's just calling out to the Lord in desperation. The New Living Translation says he was terrified and began to sing. Save me, Lord, he shouted. That's the idea. Have we ever done that? Has the peril of a situation prompted us to cry out to God? The heartfelt nature of his prayer is also seen in the directness of his petition. For what did he pray? Salvation. He expressed his deepest desire in that situation, which was to be saved. There was no beating around the bush to get around to what was important. It was very short, again, only three words. But the power of prayer is not in the length, but in the strength. Prayers don't have to be long to be valuable. Remember in Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the publican, In Luke 18, verse 13, the publican beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's all he said. But that, along with his sincerity, was enough for Jesus to say he went down to his home justified. Peter knew that Jesus knew his situation. He didn't have to explain it in detail. He just expresses his sincere desire to be rescued from that peril with wholeheartedness. You know, the same holds true for non-Christians who are seeking salvation. What was on Peter's lips should be in our hearts, namely a heartfelt desire for spiritual rescue. There's no room for pretending or to try to please someone or gain the approval of other people. It needs to be a genuine penitence that leads to the desired salvation. What should be in our hearts should echo the words of Psalm 109, verse 26, which says, Help me, O Lord my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Again, we have to emphasize these words alone are not enough to save. We must submit to the will of God and follow the path that he's outlined in the New Testament. But think back upon the day of Pentecost recorded in Acts 2 when the Jews who believed Peter's preaching about Jesus and about their own sin spoke. They didn't ask, what do we need to pray in order to be saved? No, in Acts 2, 38 said, they said, brothers, what shall we do? And the answer given in verse 38 was not as some would expect, nothing. There's nothing you need to do. It's all in God's hands and his grace. No, the answer was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what people today must do. To obtain forgiveness. What about the Christian who has sinned? The way to obtain forgiveness is not, again, to be rebaptized, it's to pray for forgiveness. 
And that prayer needs to come from a heart that is absolutely sincere. We should be humble and genuine before God when we make that sort of a request. In the third place, Peter's prayer was submissive. And this is seen in the fact that he recognized Christ's identity. Notice he addresses Jesus as Lord. Peter considered Jesus to be his master. This was an indication that Peter understood the deity of Jesus. It's another way he confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. He knew that Jesus Jesus was the only one with the power to save him in that moment. He knew Jesus had the ability to act on his behalf and to come to his rescue. Jesus came walking on the water after feeding 5,000. He knew the power of Jesus. He knew Jesus had the ability to come to his rescue. It was also submissive in that it was uttered with faith. This was a prayer that demonstrated his faith. With confidence and trust in Jesus, he cried out. If he didn't have that faith, there would be no need for this prayer. He would have just continued to struggle to try to save himself. There would be no purpose in crying out to Jesus if he didn't believe in Jesus' power. It was also submissive in that acknowledged the goodness of of the Lord. Peter cried out to Jesus in confidence because he knew that Jesus would act. He believed that Jesus not only had the power, but had the willingness to come to his rescue. And his words are evident of his belief in the Lord's goodness. For the non-Christian who is seeking salvation, that person must acknowledge that Jesus is the only Savior. In John 14, 6, Jesus declared, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's exclusive. That's, as some would say, narrow-minded. But that's the words of Jesus himself. I am the way. Likewise, Acts 4, 12 says, There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men, by which we must be saved. Part of that acknowledgement is Jesus is the Son of God. In John 8, 24, Jesus said, For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We must also have faith in not only the ability, but also the willingness of Jesus to save us. Without this, there's no basis for obedience to the gospel message. These are also important for the Christian who is asking for forgiveness. We must be a believer fully convinced that Jesus will take away our sins when we have true repentance and express our desire to keep serving him faithfully. In the fourth place, Peter's prayer was also personal. What was Peter's cry? It was, Lord, save me. Would it have been wrong for Peter to pray for others? Not at all, but Peter's mind is centered on himself and his own needs. This is Peter calling out to the Lord with his most sincere desire. His prayer also evidenced the fact that he recognized his own inadequacy. He couldn't save himself. By himself, the text says, he was beginning to sink. More literally, the language conveys the idea of having begun to sink. So the NASB says, when he began to sink, he cried out. Peter is in the process of sinking, and he has no power to secure his own rescue. And so he calls out, to the Lord for his own benefit. Peter's prayer was a prayer of reliance. He simply put himself in the Lord's hands. He didn't tell Jesus the way he thought that he should save him, 
He didn't come up with his own rescue plan. He left that up to the Lord. We need to understand that religion is a very personal matter. And that includes prayer. In one sense, people can pray for us. By that, we mean that they can pray for our benefit. They can petition the Lord for our good. But in another sense, they can't pray for us. We must do our own praying. They can't be our stand-in and pray for us. It's something we must do as individuals. And so prayer is very personal. In fact, there are times, like in Peter's situation, when praying is all that we can do. There may be a situation beyond our control. We have no direct action we can take to change it. And when those times come, prayer may be all that we can do. But prayer is something we can do. With regard to the salvation of someone who is not yet a Christian, this is also a vital consideration. From the outset, we have to understand that we cannot save ourselves. We are completely inadequate. There's no way for us to take away our own sins, and so we must fully rely on the Lord. And we must recognize we don't determine how we will be saved. We can't come up with our own plan. Heaven is the one that established the plan that we must follow. God hasn't left it up to decide how we can receive his divine pardon. We must follow his plan. In addition, there's no one who can obey the gospel for us. It's a personal responsibility that we must take on for ourselves. No one can believe for us, repent for us, confess for us, be baptized for us. Those are personal actions that we must do if we expect God's forgiveness. The same holds true for the Christian who needs forgiveness. We must do our own repenting. We must do our own praying. We cannot ignore those things and hope that God will save us anyway, that he will forgive us of those sins. Again, we follow his plan. We must take the initiative to comply with what the Lord has specified in order to receive exactly what we need. Lastly, we also see that Peter's prayer was effective. He was in the middle of sinking, and he cried out for salvation. And you know what the Bible doesn't say? That Peter died that day from drowning. <laughs> doesn't say that, does it? The Lord acted to grant his petition. Look at verses 31 and 32. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus immediately comes to Peter's rescue. There was no delay in granting Peter's request. His prayer was answered, and answered with an immediate yes. Now we do need to understand that with prayers in general, the Lord does answer our prayers. You may recall number one song in 1991 by country artist Garth Brooks. The song entitled Unanswered Prayers. It was co-authored with two other writers. And the song suggests that just because God doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. And that some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Now we can certainly understand the sentiment of that song but it isn't biblically accurate. The reality is God does answer. There are no unanswered prayers, but God may not answer the way and in the time frame that we expect. The answers no and wait are still answers. They just might not be the answers we wanted or that we expected. But in the case of Peter, he received an immediate yes, and he was pulled from the water. In verse 31, notice Jesus said, O ye of little, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter's little faith and doubt isn't a reference to his prayer. 
Instead, it's a reference to what Peter had before the prayer when he became afraid because of the wind. There's no reason to accuse Peter of not having faith when he prayed. Without faith, there would be no reason for him to cry out. We can learn from Peter that there are times when all we can do is pray, and that's enough. James chapter 5 or 16 tells us the prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. What about the non-Christian? Again, we're not saved by faith only. We're not saved by just saying a prayer. But when we do all that the New Testament teaches is required, we can be assured of our salvation. Unlike general prayers, there will never be a no or a wait with regard to our salvation. God will grant that to us. The same holds true with the Christian's prayer for forgiveness. We don't have to wonder and hope beyond hope that God will pardon us. No, he will say yes every time according to the Bible. When we come in sincere humility and petition the Lord for his forgiveness, we will become recipients of that. And we should praise God for that. Peter's prayer is certainly unique, isn't it? But it teaches us a great deal about the characteristics of prayer that apply universally. It also reminds us of what needs to be true for those who are yet outside of Christ and have never obeyed the gospel. It tells us about our responsibility. And it can provide encouragement to put our faith into action by becoming obedient to the plan God has for our rescue. This morning, if you're in the audience, you're not a member of the Lord's Church and you're seeking salvation, we urge you to consider the urgency of obedience in order to obtain that salvation that God has promised to grant to us. Maybe you've already done that, but as a Christian, you've fallen into sin. We urge you to repent and to pray for forgiveness. And in either of those cases, forgiveness is guaranteed. You will have the assurance that the Lord will grant you forgiveness, cleansing your soul through the blood of Jesus. If you're ready to take that step, don't put it off. Recognize the urgency. If in your heart this morning you're crying out, Lord, save me, and we can help you with your obedience, we would be honored to do that. If you would, at the singing of this song, just take a seat on one of the front pews, we'd be happy to assist you. If you have a need, please make that known as together we stand and sing together. There's a fountain.